ESPN, the world leader in motorsports coverage, presents Speed World. be dormant but the battle for the muscle car championship of the world may be just about ready to explode hello everyone i'm bob Varsha, welcoming you to portland oregon oregon's rose city for today's running of the purelated 300 for camel gto and gtu cars with me skipper tom blackhaller has curtailed his camel gt driving career to provide commentary for today's race and tom as i mentioned this gto gtu battle is about as tough as it could be yeah, they have Ford, Toyota, and Chevrolet all within a few points of each other with eight cars racing to see who will take the manufacturer's championship. Should be very exciting. Now, the GTU cars, those with smaller displacement engines, are also going to be out there in today's race, and they've raised some controversy recently. Jack Baldwin, who was driving the Camaro at uh, Summit Point, West Virginia, collided with the GTU car and uh, put his car out of the race and is not able to compete today. Tom Gloy was also put out of the Summit Point race, so the GTO drivers are going to have to look out for the GTU cars today. And Portland's a very tough racetrack to do that. Our colleagues Gary Lee and Marty Reed will be manning pit road today. Let's go down to Gary now for more on that manufacturer's war. Thank you, Bob, and good afternoon. We have documented the manufacturer's shootout, but to characterize this weekend, we can call it a battle of rhetoric between the two drivers in the front row. Scott Pruitt inside in a four-year-old Mustang they nicknamed Christine, and outside the potent turbo Celica of Willie T. Ribs. He's won the last two GTO outings. In a practice session on Friday, they went into first turn side by side. Both accused the other of leaning on each other. Willie said Scott pushed him onto the alligator strips. Scott said, taint so. If anybody was leaning, it was Willie. There's also the matter of sandbagging. The Fords are saying the Celicas are sandbagging. They're not showing all their potential power. And the Celica drivers are saying, uh-uh. The Ford V8s had the advantage on this long front straightaway here at Portland. It should be interesting on the first lap in the first turn. But a real story could come from road two. And with more on that, here's our colleague, Marty Reed. Thanks, Gary. You're right. Waiting in the wings to see if uh, Pruitt and Ribs knock each other out of the box is this man driving the mobile Corvette. First time we've seen it on ESPN. Greg Pickett has run two races in this car so far. He's finished second twice. They think with the new radial tires they've just gotten from Goodyear, they might be able to move up into that number one spot. We'll keep an eye on it. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, to get to the bottom of this, who has the best car for Portland story, we decided to go right to the horse's mouth. So we got some of the principals from Ford, Chevy, and Toyota together, and here's what they had to say. I, I really don't think that we need to talk to the Chevrolet group. You know, they're not really in this contest. They're, uh, they're real slow down the straightaway when you put them next to Superfast. You know, Superfast is lifting at the end of the straightaway just so he's not embarrassing to us, you know. I think they've got such a mechanical advantage because we've been so superior with all of our Ford products in the past that now the rules have come to favor the... My team owner, my team owner, Dan Gurney, told me to hand all you guys handkerchiefs so you could cry on them. There must be a crying contest going on here. First of all, all these Toyota guys and the Chevy guys all were Ford drivers a little while back, right? They all started Ford. They learned there. They, you know, learned with Jack Roush. They learned how to build cars. Charlie Stuck, a former Ford guy. And after we learn how to get the job done, we go someplace where we can get it done. And that's Chevrolet or Toyota. Now the Chevys, the Fords with the V8s, they've got the, the advantage on this track because you've got that turbo lag. What do you do to uh, sort of even it out? They all, you know, a lot of people think that we're stronger than them in a straight line. Actually, Roush's cars have been faster than us in a straight line. So it's about even. There's a lot of parity here. And just because they don't win every race, they feel that we have the advantage. I've been winning races before I got in a Toyota, so they all know I can get it on no matter what I'm in. You definitely have a horsepower advantage coming here with the V8s. No, we, I, I think you've been talking to Willie and Dan Gurney uh, way too long. We have a very distinct horsepower disadvantage. 
And the other problem is that we weigh about 500 pounds more. Well, the, the Toyotas definitely have the advantage. Uh, we can't even keep up with them on the straight. We have the uh, radar readings, and they've got us by about four or five mile an hour. We'll put it this way. I'll trade cards with him anytime he wants to, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, perhaps the only real way to solve the question of who has the best race car is to go racing, and we'll do that in just a moment. We'll be back to take a look at this 1.9-mile Portland International Race Course and turn them loose in the Pure Later 300 for Camel GTO and GTU cars. Well, as we head down that start finish straightaway, the GTP cars will top out at about 180-plus miles an hour. Then we have a, a long, fast right-hand turn, turn 1 and 1A, second gear. Then we've got another turn 2, stay in second gear, all the way through this section. Then we've got a left-hand turn, one of the few left-hand turns on the racetrack, still in second gear. Then we've got a right-hand turn 4. This is very important because it's a very it's a series of turns as we have our left right heading onto the back straightaway. Tom, take us down the back straight. We go down the back straight at about 160 miles an hour into a quick left right chicane before setting up for turn nine, which is the most important turn on the course because it gives us the speed to come out around turn nine and onto the front straight. Okay, thank you, Tom. Now, here's the way they'll line up for today's race. On the pole in a four-year-old Mustang, Scott Pruitt out of Roseville, California, barely five one-hundredths of a second behind on the outside, Willie T. Ribs in a Toyota Celica Turbo. Inside row two, Chris Cord in the second Team Toyota Turbo, alongside Greg Pickett in that powerful V8 Chevy Corvette. Inside row three is Bob Earl representing Pontiac with his Fiero, Tom Gloy in the Jack Roush Ford Mustang alongside. Inside row four, Irv Hare from the Oldsmobile camp in a Toronado, alongside Inside Bruce Jenner in another Ford Mustang. Inside row five, Tommy Riggins in a Chevy Camaro from the Protofab camp, alongside Roger Mandeville, a former GTO champion, a Mazda RX-7. Inside row six, Lynn St. James, our sometime broadcast colleague, will start her Ford Mustang alongside Rick Moore in a Chevy Camaro. Row seven will have Terry Visger on the pole in the GTU class for the smaller engine sports cars, alongside defending series champion Tom Kendall in a Mazda. Row eight will have Walt Benson in a Pontiac Firebird on the inside, Carl Durkheimer in a GTU Porsche Carrera alongside. Row 9, Max Jones will have a Nissan 300 ZXT on the inside, looking to make some history. Frank Poole in a Chevy Corvette alongside. The next row will have a Chevy Camaro, Bruce Sanders at the wheel, next to a Mazda RX-7 with Amos Johnson at the controls. Row 11 will have Dick Murray's Pontiac Fiero inside, Monty Shelton's Porsche 911 outside. Row 12, Bart Kendall in his RX-7 alongside Gary Oberlin's Porsche. Row 13, Paul Romano in a Mazda alongside Earl Pearson's Chevy Corvette. Row 14, Paul Barnholz, Nissan, alongside Vance Swift and a Mazda RX-7. Row 15 will have Rick Eppinger and Wayne Nunnally's Porsche inside, Dick Rear's Mazda outside. Row 16, Dave Cruz and a Mercure XR4 Ti, alongside Rick Longmire's Porsche. And 17, Carlos Bobadet, George Robinson and a Mazda, the Porsche of Charlie Getsky alongside Paul and Margie Smith-Haas in their Porsche, husband-wife team there in the very last spot. And here comes now the big flag is off. Go ahead, Tom. Drag race to the start, one by Willie T. Ribs in the 99 car. He's going to be first down into that very dangerous turn one. And that's really a surprise to me as you see his teammate, Chris Cord, moving up on the inside of Scott Pruitt. I thought Pruitt, with that big Mustang, would have the horsepower to get to turn one in first. But Willie T. Ribs gets that Toyota Turbo spooled up, and it's Ribs, Pruitt in the Mustang, Cord in the Toyota, and behind him, the Pontiac Fiero of Bob Earl in fourth position as they head out first lap here at Portland. I think maybe the pace was just a little too hot set by Scott Pruitt on the start there in the the Toyota got spooled up on the turbine and was able to really get a good jump on the start. Excellent start by the 99 car, Willie T. Ribs. Now, tires should not be a problem throughout this race unless the drivers get a little too heavy on the button. The track is cool, although it is said to be a little bit slippery, but the weather is cool, and that, Tom, spells turbo time. You bet. And here they come into the turn nine, which will get slippery, but, but they've got cold tires right now, and Willie T. Ribs being very careful through turn nine. Pruitt's right on his tail, and now the horse horsepower of the Toyota and the horsepower of the Mustang will get a good test of each other. Here's a little inside scoop, folks. Forget the rest of the race. These are the two guys everybody's been talking about all weekend long. We mentioned they got together in practice. There was some shouting between the Ford and Toyota camps, which are parked right next to each other here in Portland, in the paddock, and Willie T and Scott Pruitt. But let's just say they're not about to lease an apartment together. They used to be, excuse me, Willie T used to drive for the Ford team. Willie left. Scott came aboard. Jack Rouse says, no bones about it. Scott is the best driver 
I've ever had. Willie takes that as a personal insult. And he's out to prove to the Fords that he is the best sedan driver. Looking back now, there you see Tom Gloy, and he has made his way past the Fiero, and it looks like Greg Pickett's going to stick the Chevy Corvette inside Bob Earl's nose. Now he drops back. Third, fourth, fifth on the racetrack. Bruce Jenner in sixth position. From this first lap, Bob, it looks like Toyota has about a three-car length advantage down the straight. And uh, Scott Pruitt, however, is driving the Mustang very, very fast. And here we see Pruitt coming right up on the back of Willie T. Ribs entering turn nine. And he's less than a car length behind him in the very critical turn nine. And now the Toyota's going to open up on him if he does the same thing he did the first lap. Second gear off that turn, then quickly up through the gearbox, taking fifth gear right about here, hitting speeds in excess of 160. 70 miles an hour down this long drag strip that makes up the front side at Portland International. When we look at Scott Pruitt here, we see Chris Cord coming into the picture on the front straight. Cord was able to reel in the number one car of Scott Pruitt just a little bit. Now here's the part of the course where it seems like Pruitt picks up on Wellie T. Ribs. He's uh, coming right up the back of the a little better under braking, and uh, now is again less than a car length behind. Now we're working lap three, and notice up ahead you see a car about to be lapped within three laps of the start of the race on this 1.9 mile circuit and it looks like Margie Smith Haas and that Porsche 924 a GTU car down on power down on speed and she is history. Willie T. Ribs in the lead goes whistling past Scott Pruitt right behind. It's going to be quite a race. I think that Pruitt is uh, not going to let Ribs get any away from him at all. Although I think it's going to be very, very difficult for Pruitt to get past Ribs. Here, Pruitt closes up again to within less than a car length to open up on the straight. And here comes the power of the Corvette turning on. By the end of the straight, uh, the Toyota might have a couple of car lengths lead. You see Chris Court sneaking into the picture up behind Pruitt uh, down the front straight. Boy, the scuttlebutt has been thick and fast here in Portland. The question is, who? got the power. And you see Here Scott Pruitt dives inside Willie, but no. Ribs shuts the door as they head into one. It looks like that's where Pruitt's going to make his move under braking. He appears to have a little bit better braking capability than the Toyota, which is surprising because the Mustang is a heavier car. But his brakes are working very, very well. But in these long races, the brakes tend to go away. So if Pruitt can't get it done early on, he's going to have a tough time as it gets later in the race and his brakes begin to fade. 27-year-old Scott Pruitt out of Roseville, California, the defending champion in the GTO class. A lot of folks think he's out here specifically to make those Toyotas run. Leads Scott Pruitt just barely in the 97 lap Purolator 300 for Campbell GTO GTU cars. There you see another car being lapped as Willie T. Ribs and Scott Pruitt continue their mano a mano battle at the front of this race. In the early laps of this race, Bob, Willie T. Ribs clicked off a 106.6, which is about one second a lap slower than his qualifying pace for an average speed of about 103 miles an hour. That's a very hot pace, and uh, it's unlikely that the tires and the brakes will allow the cars to keep up those paces, but with uh, these two drivers nose to tail, neither one of them is going to back off. Which plays to a good point, Tom. A lot of the rumors around pit road said that Scott Pruitt, who doesn't normally drive the full GTO schedule, is here basically as a rabbit. He's out there to push Willie, make him run as hard as he can, maybe get him to break. He can pull Chris Court along well. Meanwhile, behind him, the other Ford Mustangs, Tom Gloy presently in fourth position, and Bruce Jenner, presently in sixth on the racetrack, can lay back and hopefully pull a win out. But look, we're seeing lapping going on as they come through turn nine and head up down the long straightaway and up through the gearbox. Gary Lee. Here comes the uh, leader, Willie T. Ribs, passes slower GTU cars with Scott Pruitt still right on his tail. Willie's driving very, very smoothly. He's experiencing a little oversteer in the back part of the course coming out of turn three, which is not happening to Pruitt's car. But Willie looks very, very smooth. He looks like he's relatively uh, easy uh, leading the number one car. But Gary Lee has a story now from Pitt Road. Well, Bob, you intimated as to what the strategy might be for Scott Pruitt. We'll go right to the top, the source, Jack Roush. What is the strategy with Scott Pruitt? Well, we're expecting a real hot race at the end. Early, so we're prepared to do the same thing. We've got a full load of fuel on Scott. We put 16 gallons of, of fuel and soft tires on it to make a real dash for the cash at the end. There have been rumors. He's not in a title chase in the point.
points right now. You might let him serve as the rabbit and go out there and set a very quick pace, if possible, to perhaps burn out the turbo. Well, we're interested. I didn't hear all of uh, your question, but we are interested in competing for the Manufacturer's Championship for Ford and uh, for Mustang. And with that, Scott is here to put the pressure on the Toyotas. We're willing to see his car not finish if we have to in order to keep him under the maximum amount of pressure. Well, let's go on down Pimp Road and check in with somebody else on some strategy party with Dan Gurney. Dan Jack Roush says that he's going to try and run Scott Pruitt as long and as hard as he can if it means running into the ground trying to get those Toyotas out of there. How do you respond to that kind of strategy? What will you do to counter it? Well, they're running about uh, one and a half seconds off their fastest time in, in uh, qualifying uh, with a full load and with the traffic. So they're all running as hard as they can run. And we'll see what happens. Uh, this is it. I don't know what else you can do right at the moment. Survival of the fittest. Let's go back out on course. Okay, Dan Gurney looking on as Willie T. Ribs in a Toyota from Dan Gurney's All-American Racing Shops in Santa Ana, California, tries to make his way around Margie smith Haas. She is being lapped for the second time in this race, and Scott Pruitt is right there. As Jack Roush talked, you saw Scott Pruitt and Willie T. come together. This is going to be a toe-to-toe -to -toe slugout in Portland. It looks like uh, Scott Pruitt has a little better brakes than Willie T. Ribs, and if, he, if he's going to pass, it's going to be down in turn one or in turn nine. A little bit less power for the Mustang, a little bit better brakes, surprising. Great mechanical battle here. That's the two-liter, four-cylinder turbocharged Toyota coming in at about 2,200 pounds up against that 600-horsepower V8, five-and-a-half-liter fuel-injected Ford at about 2,600 pounds. Now, here's the battle just behind. This is for third place. That's Chris Gordon, and his mirrors right now are full of the Mustang of former Trans Am champion Tom Gloy. These two are less than two seconds behind the two leaders, and this is a great race also. Although Gloy is a two or three car lengths behind Cord, but this is also going to be a very, very critical race, the race between Cord and Gloy. In fact, these guys could be the only ones left standing at the end if they can run a pace that allows them to stay away from that battle up in front in case the body work still starts to really starts to fly. There you see the interval between the battle for first and the battle for third. Tom Gloy out of California, 84 Trans Am champion. A two-time victor thus far this year, including a solo win at West Palm. Here are your leaders, once again, about to lap GTU traffic. We mentioned that the smaller, slower GTU cars are going to have to be passed regularly at the speeds these GTO cars are managing. About a 20-mile-an-hour difference in speed between the leaders and the ones behind them. And there's the 71 car. That's Amos Johnson. He has spun down in turn one. Amos Johnson with an incredible record of three straight 24 hours of Daytona victories running his new style Mazda RX-7. He's got a problem early on here at Portland. As Chris Cord goes around Amos, here comes Tom Gloy. Tom Gloy is closed up a little bit on Chris Cord. Here are the two leaders, Willie T. Ribs and Scott Pruitt. The way these cars are going, Scott Pruitt has made three or four attempts to pass Willie T. in the first 10 laps of this race. So we're looking for a really, really great battle here. Let me give you a footnote to Amos Johnson's story. He is in a battle for the GTU champion with the defending champion, Tom Kendall. Right now, Amos Johnson trails Kendall by about 24 points coming in, so he badly needs to make up some time on 20-year-old Tom Kendall. That spin's not going to help him. But the battle is right here, up in front. Willie T. Ribs and Scott Pruitt. You see in front of them the Pontiac Fiero that they're about to catch. That was your pole sitter in the GTU class, Terry Visger who won three straight GTU races earlier this year, but right now he is about to become the meat in the sandwich between Willie T. Ribs and Scott Pruitt. As per instructions by Jack Rouse, Scott Pruitt is putting extreme pressure on Willie T. Ribs. You can see him closing right up here as they go by the slower GTU cars, and uh, that's going to be a very critical element in this race, how well these drivers can get around the GTU cars. It's a, one of the most important parts of racing, even though the GTO drivers complain about it quite a lot. Uh, it's got to be done very, very well, or else uh, the race will end up with the GTO car and the GTU car coming together, as it did with Jack Baldwin and Tom Gloy at Summit Point last race. Willie T. Ribs was very outspoken about getting only qualified GTU drivers on the track. Well, there are 35 cars still in it here at Portland. Willie T. Ribs is your leader. Scott Pruitt chasing him down. K for GTO GTU cars. Willie T. Ribs is your leader. That's the way they've been for the last 20 laps or so. Here is the second five, and a lot of big names in here as well. Greg Pickett driving the Mobile Corvette. Bruce Jenner in a Mustang. Irv Hare in the uh, 
And Lynn St. James in the Mustang and Tommy Riggins in the Camaro are making up the back part of the top ten. And up front, it's starting to look like a San Diego freeway at rush hour, and well, Scott Pruitt has gotten into one of the GTO cars. They're off. I believe that's in the turn one, turn two area. That was in turn one. That was Pruitt trying to get by ribs again, and he got nailed by a GTU car. He, they came together. Pruitt's back on the track. Looks like very little damage to his car. He's accelerating again. And that will shake up the top five considerably. It looked like maybe it was one of the CCR RX-7 Mazdas, either Tommy Kendall, the defending GTU champ, or uh, his brother, Bart Kendall, the driving identical cars. We just saw them as they disappeared into the dust. But that is a big blow to Scott Pruitt. Let's see if we can take another look at it as they head down into one. Here comes Pruitt, following ribs. And he tries to go to the inside of the Kendall car, doesn't make it, pushes them both off the track, and ribs gets away scot-free. Very risky move by Scott Pruitt, but that's what he's there to do, to try to push as hard as he could. He's lost about 15 seconds. We've got another angle of it, and it looks like it's maybe one of the Porsche 924s that gets sandwiched here, and I don't think it's his fault. Ribs hit him on the left side, and then Scott tries to come up on the right. Yep, Pruitt trying to go to the inside, ribs on the outside, and that GTU car got sandwiched really hard. That was the number 24 car of Rick Eppinger out of Portland, Oregon, a local favorite who took a beating there, and I don't think there was a thing he could have done about it. Marty Reed is on pit road. Well, guys, guys, getting back to that accident for a second, what happened was Monty Shelton and Neil Shelton, the 57 Porsche, was laying down some oil. The corner workers didn't get the slick flag out, the uh, grease on the track flag out until the leaders had gone past. Let's go down to Gary Lee because that's what's happened. The end result is Pruitt's now in the pits. We have Scott Pruitt in the pits. This totally changes their strategy. They are changing all four tires. Obviously, at this point in the race, they cannot go to the softer compound they had planned. They're topping off the fuel. They will have to make one more stop. So the strategy totally out the window with that off-track excursion. They have completed their service, and Scott Pruitt is away. Well, tough lake racing luck, that is, for Scott Pruitt. As he makes his way back onto the racetrack, you see the leaders coming onto the front straightaway behind him. So Scott Pruitt, who is very much in the thick of the battle for the lead here at Portland, now is going to have to work very hard to avoid getting passed by these men. Willie T. Ribs, your leader. Tom Gloy, Tom Scott Pruitt's teammate now in second place. And in third is Chris Cord in the second All-American Racers Toyota. Yeah, they come through turn one again, where the where the accident occurred. It's a very, very tricky part of the track. Most of the passing is attempted down there, but if you get in too hot, lock up your brakes, the car just won't steer, and that's what happened. I think Ribs and Pruitt both got in there very, very hot with a little bit of oil on the track, and that was what happened. Now we've got a car off the racetrack. That's the number 16 machine, Carlos Poveda and George Robinson. California Texas team in a Mazda RX-7. They are off into the woods there. We have a replay. Let's take a look at what happened to these guys. Coming down there, you see Carl Durkheimer's Porsche, the 56 car, followed by Amos Johnson, the GTU cars, running very close together. And into your picture will come the number 16 of Carlos Bobeda. Same part of the racetrack. Yeah, same exactly. There must be oil in there. Well, everybody's on the brakes hard at that point. And uh, they just the cars have a little bit of trouble getting adhesion, and they're right off the track. They're right on the limit on that turn. That's a very tricky turn, turn one. Everybody's going to take a close look at that turn as you see Bowie back on the racetrack in his Mazda. Let's go down to Gary Lee in the pits, and Pruitt's back. Well, Pruitt is back in. Jack Roush is standing by. I don't know if we can get a word from him. No, he walks back away, so we're not sure what the problem is. They go to work on the left rear tire again. There may be a problem up in the suspension area. They're working on the left rear. They will change the left rear tire again. Jack, what's the problem? Well, we got some difficulty in the left rear of the car. We haven't figured out what it is yet. Yeah, All right. The tire earlier, but now they've got a problem in the left rear. All right, as you hear from the team owner, Jack Roush, a problem in the left rear. They are changing the tire, but that may not be the problem. The car remains up on the jacks. Obviously, this will totally change the strategy and take Scott Pruitt out of contention for a win here at Portland. Well, now they have taken that spare tire back across the... Uh, wall so they will not change the tire it obviously is something in the suspension or the chassis and Pruitt is underway again and you see the bodywork damage to the left side of Scott Pruitt's car so apparently that was a much more expensive accident than we originally thought Tom the leader of the Mustang group is now Tom Bloy and he is pressing Willie T. Ribs just about as hard as Scott Pruitt was so this race has not lost any of its intensity although there's been quite a bit of action
You talk about intensity, that yellow car to the left is the leader in the GTU class. That is Max Jones just getting dusted by Willie T. Ribs and Tom Gloy. Jones is in this race hoping to become the first pro driver to win in four different classes in the same season. He has already won in off-road racing. He has won in street stock or showroom stock racing. And he has won in the Sports Car Club of America's pickup truck racing class. So Max Jones is a guy who brings a tool for the job no matter what kind of racing he's in. It's great to see a new face up in the front of the GTU. Class. Terry Visker has been dominating this class the last couple of races, and uh, although Terry's going very well, uh, it's good to see a new face up there. Here comes Willie T. Ribs past the GTU leader. Marty Reed has a comment from the pits. Well, guys, you were mentioning a Max Jones. This Alderman Nissan racing team has had a heck of a weekend. They've had all kinds of fuel pickup problems. They didn't even know how well they were going to qualify until they got the car out there. Did pretty well. And today, things are falling into place so far so good. They're looking like they're on cloud nine. All they got to do is survive about 65 more laps. Okay, Scott Pruitt is back on the racetrack in 12th position. But you see the lead battle going on between Tom Bloy and the number 22 Mustang and Willie T. No question, Willie T is the most flamboyant driver in any form of racing around the country. We asked him for his pick in the race. I'll predict I'm the favorite. I'm like a horse. Call me Ali Shiva. This is like the Kentucky Derby. We're all going to hoof it. T has been hoofing it up front since the very beginning. One short break when Scott Pruitt got by, but it looks like Pruitt is going to be out of it. The battle is right here with Willie T. Ribs out front. Behind him, Tom Gloy pressing for all he's worth in his Ford Mustang. Plenty of racing still to come from Portland. Tom Blackall are with you. Marty Reed and Gary Lee are on pit road. Greg Pickett in the Corvette has had a sudden and dramatic turn of events. Officials asked him to come on in. He's in the pits now, and they're taking a very close look at fluids coming out from underneath that car. The Mobile Corvette's a brand new car. She's been racing just a couple of races, and uh, it's not surprising to have a little bit of trouble. Unfortunately, this amount of trouble in an hour and a half to hour and three quarter race puts Greg Pickett totally out of any chance to win the race. But he's out there mainly to race as hard as he can, of course, but also to do development on this car. So there he goes out again, and he's back in the race. Greg Pickett out of Alamo, California, another former sedan champion of the Sports Car Club of America Trans Am Series. His first two races in that car produced two second-place finishes, and he led a great deal of the GTO event at Summit Point not too long ago. Let's go down to Gary Lee, who's once again in Scott Pruitt's pit. We heard Jack Roush say there was a problem with the left rear. Actually, this is a tire off the left front. We talk about flat spotting a tire when a car spins. There's that lock up in the brakes, the instant heat rise. Well, right here is the flat, the flat spot on that left front. However, it was also punctured right here, and it was gouged right here. A lot of damage to this. This is the Bridgestone. Again, we talked about the Bridgestones on the front. The Goodyear's on the rear. So Scott is well back in competition now. Part of the reason, flat spotting the tire and puncturing the tire. Well, back up front, the action continues. Scott Pruitt is apparently out of it. Willie T. Ribs doing everything in his power to keep Tom Gloy behind him. There you saw the number four of uh, That's Bob, Bob Earl's That's car. That's Pontiac Fierro's. He a lap down at yeah, this point. Yeah, you bet he must be. That was Gloy and Ribs going by Bob Earl. And uh, Gloy has been racing very, very well, very hard, trying to catch uh, Willie T. Ribs. And here's Gloy making a, locking up the brakes, going into turn one, trying to get around Willie. Now watch Gloy recover here and get right back on the power and suck right up behind Ribs, not losing at a bit with that attempted pass. That's very difficult to do, to attempt to pass like that and not lose a bit. Here's Tom Gloy right in the race. Now that was a few laps earlier. Tom Gloy remains in second place. Willie T. is your leader. Eight cars right up there on the lead lap. Bob Earl pitted the Fierro which dropped him back. He now finds himself back close to being out of the top ten. In fact, he's eighth in the race right now. Willie T is your leader. You've got Tom Gloy in second, Chris Cord in third place, Bruce Jenner moves up to fourth place, and another one of those Jack Roush repaired Ford Mustangs. Nothing much has changed in this race with Willie T. Ribs holding a very, very strong and steady pace. He's fended off attacks from Scott Pruitt. He spended off attacks from Tom Gloy, and he's been able to run right up in the front with his teammate, Chris Cord, in third place, just out of the picture here behind the 22 car of Tom Gloy. 
it looks like the Mustangs are running very, very well in the turns. Well, E.T. Ribs is having to hold on the inside of the track to keep the Mustang from going around him in the back side of the course through turns two, three, and four. But when the Toyota gets out on the straights, away she goes to about a three or four car length lead. So the Mustangs seem to be handling this a little bit better, and the Toyota seem to have just a little more power. And the sun is beginning to come out here in Portland. That is going to make this racetrack even slicker than it has been thus far. Now we're getting word that Greg Pickett's problem for the pits was his Corvette was exceeding the allowable noise level here at Portland International. There is a decibel level that these cars are not allowed to run higher than. And for more on that, we asked Lynn St. James to explain the mufflers, and she did in our Quick Fact. Everyone knows that race cars are loud. But here in Portland, we're trying to control the noise level, and they allow a maximum decibel level of 110. So we had to take and add mufflers on my Mustang here. These exhaust pipes used to be straight pipes. We got a lot of horsepower that way. So we've had to give up some horsepower to reduce the noise level down to about 108. Just to give you a comparison on that, most street cars would run at about 70 decimals. So we've lost some horsepower, but we've controlled the noise. I was at a rock concert recently, and I'd like to see what the VU meter is at one of those. Okay, thank you, Lynn. The action continues hot on the racetrack, no matter how much noise they're making. Willie T. Ribs and Tom Bloy are laughing at better than 101 miles an hour. On the average, they are running within a second and a half of the times they qualified at. A tremendous battle as Tom Bloy gets a little bit squirrely up there as he tries to get back up through the gearbox. Bloy is pushing very hard. As we mentioned, the sun is coming out here in Portland now. And in this area near the Columbia River, it heats up very, very fast as soon as the cloud cover burns off. So as it heats up, I would look for the Toyota Turbo to lose a little bit of power with respect to the naturally aspirated motor in the Mustang. Okay, the action continues. There are your leaders. It is Willie T. Ribs, followed by a Mustang, a Toyota, another Mustang, and the old of Herb Hare has moved up into the top five. We're back in Portland, where Willie T. Ribs continues to lead this 300-kilometer battle for Camel GTO and GTU cars. There you see Willie T. making his way through turn one. Tom Bloy out of California is in second place in that Ford Mustang. Third place in that group is Tommy Riggins, but he is not in the battle. He has been put down a lap. And in third place is Chris Corn in another Toyota. Now, we've seen some emergency pit stops thus far. The question is, when the Toyotas stop, how are they going to handle the pit strategy? Let's go down to Marty Reed for more on that story. Well, here in the Toyota camp, guys, they're way inside their window. They can make their stop at any time, but what they want to do is stay out there as long as possible. Talking with the head man, Dan Gurney, the one thing he said was he's worried about is what happens if they get back up to Scott Pruitt. Now that he's out of contention, will he start to block? We'll have to wait and see what happens there. Let's go down to Gary Lee. Well, here at the Ford camp, they're actually servicing four Mustangs out of one pit area. I asked Jack Rod with the uh, demise of Scott Pruitt, Will you change your strategy for Tom Gloy? Let him go as long as possible, change to a softer compound tire. He said, no, we can't. Lynn St. James now is in the pit, right on schedule. At about lap 40, you know, they we should have Tom Gloy in. However, Tom Gloy you know, started you know, the race at only 22 the where gallons doing of that fuel, the not the 31.7 that the fuel cell will hold. The thinking there was to keep the car lighter. He doesn't have enough fuel to go longer to change to a softer compound tire. So around lap 40, we'll see Bloy in, they'll change the same compound tire and top him off. Then about lap 42, we'll see the fourth member of the team, Bruce Jenner, in for his stop. Okay, thank you, Gary. As the pit stop wars are waged along pit road, now the number two car, Greg Pickett, is back in the pits. The problem, folks, he is just being too noisy. Yeah, he was 112 dB, and they black flagged him again, and you see the pit crews working on the muffler, trying to figure out how to make the car a little bit quieter at this point in the race. That's a tough thing to do. Now, they're being measured in turn nine, just as they get on the gas hard for the front straightaway, trying to find out just how noisy these cars are. And it may sound a little silly, but it actually is a very serious consideration for racetrack promoters around the country. Whenever you've got residential areas near a racetrack, Lime Rock, Connecticut springs to mind. You can't even start a race engine on Sunday in Lime Rock, Connecticut, or at least not on Sunday morning. 
they have to be concerned about the uh, the neighboring environments, people's concerns about noise at racetrack. Otherwise, we may not be racing at all. Part of the engine builder's main concern is to get the, the engine within the allowed decibel level and still put out a maximum amount of power. It's just part of the technological game that's played. And uh, nobody can complain about it because they all know the rules. And it's really relatively surprising that the mobile Corvette uh, is all of a sudden making too much noise because he's been here for two or three days. There's Willie T. Ribs getting very, very loose coming out of turn three, but he looks he looks pretty good, and he gets the power down, and again, goes out to a two or three car length lead over Tom Bloy. Willie T. Ribs with Tom Bloy moving back in once again. The Mustangs definitely seem to be superior on braking, and Tom Bloy's going to take a look to the inside in nine. Ooh. That didn't work. That's it. Uh, he's tried. Scott Pruitt's tried that on Willie Ribs. Bloy has tried it two or three times, and Willie just acts like they aren't there, and uh, they have to stay out of his way. So they, even though the Mustang's a little bit better on braking, it doesn't appear to be enough better to get around the Toyota. My thought is that if somehow the Mustang gets into the lead, it'll be easier for the Toyota to pass him because he's got that two or three car length advantage going down the straight. But on this track, that's critical. That's a 450 horsepower machine, if you believe the folks from the Toyota. To camp racing a 600 horsepower machine. Tom Bloy says, nah, not even close. 450 is whistling down the wind. They've been accused of sandbagging all year long. We mentioned that earlier. And I'm surprised by the fact that the Mustangs aren't able to at least stay with them on that straightaway. Not pass them, maybe, but at least stay with them. But it looks like they're not able to do that. Yeah, the obviously the horsepower to weight ratio of the Toyota is a little bit better because he is gaining three or four car lengths on the straights. The Mustang, however, being set up for the turns uh, is very, very nice in the turns. That's surprising because the Mustang is quite a bit heavier than the Toyota. Here we see Toyota Mustang, Toyota closing right up very, very tight. Now, this is the closest that Chris Cord has been in the last 10 or 12 laps. He is now right in the picture uh, with Willie Ribs and Tom Floyd. There you see the conga line to the top. Three runners coming down the inside of the front straightaway, passing slower traffic. Tom Deloy pulling a little bit wide, but he's narrowing up right here. The track gets down to about two or three cars wide. And Tom Boy continues to try to pass Willie T. Ribs under braking because he's just not able to do it when they accelerate. Willie T. Ribs' lap times have slowed up about two seconds a lap since the early parts of the race. Now, there's two things that are happening. The tires are going away, and it could be, as it gets a little warmer, that the turbo motor is not putting out quite as much power. Quickly approaching halfway in this 97 lap race, and there you see the Toyota camp apparently getting ready for a pit stop from one of their two cars. Now, a key point here in their pit strategy, I would guess, Tom, is not to have both cars arrive at the same time. Well, I would think not, and also they want to stay out as long as they can to have those fast tires at the end of the race, because certainly all the teams are going to try to push very, very hard right at the end of the race, which is when it counts the most. There you see Willie T. Ribs at one point in 1984 and 85, the winner of more sedan races than Here anybody comes Lloyd. else, but no championships to show for it. Boy's making his pit stop now. I would guess this is his scheduled pit stop. And here comes Marty in Tom Bloy's pit. Right on the money, right on schedule. So now it becomes a battle of the crews. Let's see which crew can service the car the quickest. Is it going to be the Jack Roush Mustang crew? Is it going to be the Dan Gurney Celica crew? It's a four-tire change. They top off the fuel. Remember, he started this race on 22 gallons. Now they will fill it up to 31.7 gallons that this cell will hold. But because they did not fill the car up to begin with, they could not go longer, allowing them to go to a softer compound tire on the pit change. They're having some trouble with the right rear. They're having some trouble with the wheel nut on the right rear. That is slowing them down, and this could cost the veteran the race. Tom Gloy waiting. The fueling has been completed. Now they get it on, and he is underway. 42.7, a very lengthy pit stop for Tom Gloy. Very lengthy indeed. Marty and Gary both there in the pits. Gary picked up the baton. Tom Gloy's back out on the racetrack. Now he's got fresh tires, but a heavier fuel load and a lot of ground to make up. Also an extra 10 seconds in the pits for that balky wheel nut on the right rear tire. What happens is those wheel nuts get so hot that they sometimes won't come off. Here are the two leaders now, the Toyotas of Willie T. Ribs and Chris Cord running very comfortably 1-2. And they are going to have to pit shortly. So we'll have to look at the pit stops, and if they can get in and out in under 40 seconds, seconds, they're going to have a good, strong gain on the Mustang of Tom Floyd. Well, the Fords put up a great fight early on, and this race is certainly anything but over. But right now, Willie T. Ribs and Tom Bloy had the All-American Team Toyota Camp, and their guru, Dan Gurney, happy indeed. Back in Portland.
Portland, and our leader, Willie T. Ribs, is about to pit his Toyota, a scheduled stop for Dan Gurney's racer. Tom Bloy's stop, which happened just about two laps ago, was 40 seconds. Remember that. Marty Reed is in the Toyota pits. Well, everybody in the Toyota pit was smiling with big, wide grins when they saw that 42-second time go because they had watches on that stop as well for Tom Bloy. They left Willie stay out an extra two laps. Now they're going to make the four-tire change, put brand-new radials on there. We talked a little bit about that a little earlier. So far, the clock is running up at 19 seconds. They seem to be having a little bit of trouble on the left rear. Now they're working, trying to take off the windshield wiper and literally just snapping the thing right off. You can see what's going on there. We're up to 30 seconds. The car's down off the jacks, 34.6, so they pick up about six to eight seconds on the stop. Well, we've got a battle of superior race cars on the track, but as you see, Willie T come back on with Lynn St. James and uh, look like Tom Bloy moving up very quickly behind him. We're certainly not seeing a battle of uh, expert pit stops. Well, they had a little trouble with those wheel nuts, which tend to expand with the heat and they get stuck on the wheel hub. And the worst thing you can have is you have to take the whole wheel hub off. Obviously, these screws aren't into that much trouble. Here's Lynn St. James, who is probably a lap down right behind Willie T ribs with uh, Scott Pruitt, who is one or two laps down right in the thick of things. Chris Court is your leader. Right now, Willie T doing battle with Lynn St. James and Scott Pruitt. I mentioned Gloy earlier, but that is Scott Pruitt. Behind them, the 85 car of Bart Kendall competing in the GTU class. But these GTO runners just sprint away. Pruitt about to get by Lynn St. James. At this stage of the race, Chris Court is leading comfortably, but he has yet to make his pit stop. Willie T. Ribs is several seconds ahead of Tom Bloy by virtue of the fact that Willie's stop was only about 34 seconds. Bloy's was 42 seconds. Long pit stops and very costly indeed for a couple of the front runners. As you watch Willie T. Ribs leading Scott Pruitt down the long front straightaway. Now here comes Tom Bloy moving up behind him. Right now, scoring is showing. Chris Cord in front, Willie T still in second place on the race track, and Tom Bloy in third. I think even though Bloy's pit stop was six or eight seconds longer than Willie T's, Tom Bloy got his car in and out of the pits, which is just as important a part of the pit stop as any, a little bit quicker than Willie did, so he's now only about four or five seconds behind, and not the total uh, difference of 10 seconds to the pit stop. Difference. And the interval we just saw there from Willie T back to Tom Bloy was made up early on pit stops. That's a good point, Tom. It's getting in and out of the pits is so important. It's not the time you're standing still. It's how long it takes you to get stopped and get back up to race. Yeah, there, there are two parts of the pit stop. First, how long it takes to cruise from the time the car is stopped until it starts again to change the tires, change the fuel, do whatever they have to do. But then the driver has to get in and out fast. Here's the leader, Chris Cord, and he will have to pit here shortly. We'd be looking for him to pit sometime, I would think, within the next three or four laps. There's no reason for him to stay out any much longer than that. Now, when pit stops happen, and they are all equally excellent, they really just simply reverse the order of running, and then everybody gets back out and reverse the order again, so there's basically no change if everybody gets good pit stops. Now, if Chris Cord can come in and get a quick pit stop, say in the 25-second range, that's going to put him a long way up on the rest of the field in this race. A 25-second pit stop should be the norm uh, with these cars. If they have no trouble with the wheel nuts, if they have no trouble with the fueling, uh, here's the 58 car that spun uh, on the front straight, but he is uh, looking looking like uh, he's getting off of turn nine okay now, so there's not uh, going to be any trouble there. Here he is slowly getting back uh, up to speed after spinning coming out of turn nine. That was the number 59 car. 59, excuse me, the 58 car, Charlie Price, Rick Weldon, and John Longmire, a California trio. That was a definitely not the kind of pit uh, turn nine exit they would like to have had. John Longmire started that car. I believe he is still in there in the Porsche 928. So the pit stops continue, and as soon as they're all over, we'll be ready for the second half of racing here in Portland. Chris Cord remains your leader, but he has yet to pit. Portland, your leader, Chris Cord, out of Beverly Hills, California, has yet to stop. We're working lap number 52 of 97 scheduled, and the question is, when will the leader pit? Bob, he'll stay out there as long as he can so that he'll have the freshest tires possible for the last part of the race. He's already run about six laps further than any other car, and Chris Cord is doing a wonderful job of staying right out in front. He's some 45 to 47 seconds in front 
of the second place car right now and he should be able to get in and out of the pits if his crew does a good job he will really uh, have a nice uh, advantage here's bob earl coming down the straight now and it looks like the roof of his car is coming off bob earl out of larksboro california in that pontiac fiero and you can see the huge gap right up there at the top of the windshield i don't know how he did it but somehow the seal has come undone and he has got it's like dragging a parachute down the front straightaway i would guess it doesn't seem to be uh, hurting him very much because he's running in a very strong fourth place so oh here's a little action in turn nine it's willie t ribs and scott no pruitt. scott pruitt looks like they might have gotten together there pruitt's doing his job and uh, willie is uh, off the course here's pruitt with uh, out of the race uh, for sure going into the pits it's very unlikely they'll be able to change that nose but they'll try to probably pull it off and see what they can do Tremendous front edge damage on Tom, uh, excuse me, Scott Pruitt's car. Let's go down to Marty Reed in Pruitt's pit. Well, we're about a couple, uh, about 50 feet away, and you can see the front, right front damage as it looks as though it's up under the wheel well there, and they're going to have a tough time trying to move the car to even be able to work on it. About six or seven crew members over the edge, and they're just backing it up, probably going to try and take it out of there because it's already dropping all kinds of fluid. Looks like they got the radiator as well, so it looks like the day is over for Scott Pruitt. Indeed, it looks as though 27-year-old Scott Pruitt, a 13-time national go-kart champion, has seen the end of his day. Tom, we talked earlier about how we were expecting now. Look, Chris Cord is slowing down considerably. Chris Cord is slowing down. Oh, that's, Willie, just, that's, Willie that's Willie up front. down quite a bit. He, he probably got knocked around pretty good in that turn nine incident. Here comes the replay of it. Pruitt dives inside. Ribs turns into him. Pitches Pruitt up over the curb. Here goes Willie spinning. Pruitt nails him, they bump together, and uh, that spin was very, very costly, especially for Willie T. Ribs. Cost him about 12 seconds. We were taking a gap on him. Here's another replay. Pruitt trying to come inside. Willie turning, and uh, lots of contact right there. Pruitt came out much the worse for wear on that, although it's unlikely that Willie T. Ribs' car came out unscathed. He is slowing down, as we saw. Now, Willie T. Ribs is on pit road. Obviously, some damage to him as well. He's going to pull in and get things straightened out. Marty Reed is there. Yes, there's definitely some damage to the right front side. They're taking off the tires on the left front. It will be a looks like a four-tire change all the way around. Dan Gurney trying to get what word into Willie to find out exactly what's wrong and to see if there's anything else that they need to do to the car as far as the chassis setup. The smoke is boiling off the brakes. The right front tire is the only one that uh, has yet to go on. It looks like everything's okay underneath. No fluids are leaking. They're going to send him back out. Willie stalls the car. Now he's got it going again. He's back out. Well, you saw that signature, that black streak of rubber on the right front fender of Willie T. Ribs' car, indicating where he and Scott Pruitt got together. They were the two heavyweight protagonists in this event, and it looks like Scott Pruitt's day is done. Willie T., though, may be mortally wounded as well. He's certainly not going to be able to get up into the thick of it after a couple of long pit stops. That's uh, Willie's second pit stop here they're repairing the track uh, where all the oil and uh, junk has been spilled on the pits there Willie T ribs that's his second stop in the pit so uh, he's probably at least a full minute behind the leader right now who uh, continues to be Chris Cord who is just cruising along now with uh, a good strong one minute lead over the second place car here's Willie T ribs back into the thick of it behind a GTU car now there is more to the Greg Pickett Corvette story, and Gary Lee is standing by now with the man himself. I don't see a police officer down here to issue a ticket for being too loud, but you got black flagged twice for being too loud, and they finally parked the Mobile One Corvette, and obviously you guys have to be steaming. Oh, we're really disappointed, and we're really upset. You know, we, we know that they have that rule here, and we they've monitored it every session. We've been just fine for two days. Uh, we haven't, we've been under the decibel reading, we haven't done a darn thing to the race car, and we come out here and in the race and we have that problem. We really just don't know what to think, and we're just terribly disappointed for Proto Fab Morrison, Mobile One, and all of our race fans over here to make left, but watch the car go fast, we just, uh, we'll have to do it another time. Well, you know, in two outings, you've had two second-place finishes. You had high hopes for this race. Do you have any recourse now as far as IMSA officials or track officials? I don't know what to do. You know, the guys that are in charge of that on the team, Charlie Felix and the other principals are taking a look at it. You know, I just drive it. They tell me to bring it in, I bring it in. I'll tell you that I've never, I've never had a good race car, and we were running when we went back out. We were right behind the leaders, the two Porsche, the two uh, turbos, and uh, Gloria, 
different time and we were running the same time, if not better, I think I probably could have passed them. So we had a good competitive race car under us and to have to stop one like that is really a shame. We'll I've see you. some up and stuff, but I've never had a stop like this. We'll see you next week at Sears Point. Greg will be back in competition then. Okay, and that is really going to dim the hopes for Chevrolet as we watch Chris Court. He has, still has yet to pit. We are working lap number 57, getting tremendous gas and tire mileage. But without Greg Pickett in this race and without Jack Baldwin, whose front-running Camaro never started this race because of the accident at Summit Point, the full Chevy hopes are going to fall on Greg Pickett's teammate's shoulders. And here that comes is Tommy Riggins. Now, here comes our leader, Chris Court, into the pits. And I think Marty Reed is standing by in the gurney pits. The crew has been waiting for the last couple laps. They were going to bring him in a little sooner, but then, of course, the problem with Willie T. Ribs, Chris Court brings it to a halt. We talked about the fact that Pruitt and Ribs might knock each other out of contention. Now, as you say, the, the run of the weight of the, the race falls on the shoulders of Chris Court for the Toyota camp, and then uh, it, whether or not he can hold on to it. So far, we're up to 15 seconds on the clock, and it's still running. The tire's on the left side only. Left side only. Now there you see a quick pit stop. Tom. Very fine pit stop. They changed rear tires only. Here comes Cord back out in the lead. He had a 50-second lead on Tom Gloy when he went into the pits, and it looks like he came out with a, a, a lead of probably uh, 30 or 40 seconds. That's uh, Bruce Jenner following uh, Chris Cord. So Chris Cord now uh, has a good, strong lead. He's changed his tires. He's picked up his full load of fuel, and he now has uh, about 40 minutes to run in this race. There you see Bruce Jenner. Now his car is very similar to Tom's. It's easy to get them mixed up. Jenner has been holding down fifth place just about all day long, so a good run for him, too. But right now, the best run of all is going to Chris Cord, who got the quick pit stop he needed, and he is back out on the racetrack with the lead and sitting in the catbird seat as the laps begin to wind down here at Portland. Toyota likes that, too, because Chris Cord is the points leader in GTO, just ahead of Tom Floyd. There you see our leader, financial investment advisor, Chris Cord, out of Beverly Hills, California. We'll be back for more racing from Portland in a moment. At Portland, a dramatic turn of events here as Tom Gloy has spun back there in the turn seven and eight area, and that's not going to do him any good. He's trying to catch the leader, Chris Cord. Gloy was 15 seconds behind the leader before that spin, and uh, it looks like he's probably now a good, strong half minute behind Chris Cord. We've got a replay. Let's take a look at what happened to Tom Gloy. Gloy's trying to pass a GTU car there at the entrance to turn seven. Very tricky place. He keeps the car fairly well under control, but it's still going to cost him. Boy, there he gets lucky. He just, he, he could have been rear-ended there by the GTU car, but he got very lucky. That spin will only have cost him about 10 or 15 seconds. I don't think he'll have to come in. Uh, he probably flat-spotted his tires a little bit, but at this point in the race, unless he's done major damage to the car, I think he has to stay out to try to catch Chris Cord. Sort of a variation on the California Highway Patrol turn there for Tom Gloy out of California. Marty Reed is now standing by with Scott Pruitt, who's out of the race. Marty? Well, we talked about it possibly being a physical battle between Willie T. Ribs and Scott Pruitt. Scott Pruitt, you're on the sidelines. Willie's also had to come in for some repairs. What happened out there? Well, first of all, to start out, um, we got tangled with a GTU car again, and that put me out, and then I was trying to work my way back up. I believe Willie had pitted and was, was coming back out, and uh, I was trying to get by him. I attempted to get by him down here on the main straight, Went up the inside and maybe he didn't see me or maybe he tried to cut me off a little bit. We tapped lightly, which spun his car lightly sideways and then trying to get out of the way, I touched him again. Your car cannot be repaired. You're not going to be back out there. No, we can't. We had the oil coolers up front and in that crash, it took one of the oil coolers out, so we're not, we won't be making it back out there. So Scott Pruitt's out. Willie T. Ribs is uh, mortally injured as far as winning this race. Let's go back out on course. And back out on course, the leader remains Chris Cord. Behind him, Tom Gloy and that Pontiac Fiero of Bob Earl. He just refuses to drop back. Those three cars on the lead lap at this point. In fourth position is the number 28 car of Tommy Riggins. And in fifth is Bruce Jenner in his Ford Mustang. Here's Tom right now. There's Tom Gloy. There's Tom Gloy, who's about 22 seconds behind Chris Cord now. That spin cost Gloy a, a very meager six seconds. That was uh, just about uh, as little time as you could possibly lose in a spin and then come back in the race. So Gloy is back in the race. His car doesn't seem to be handling real well. It knows this is coming uh, through turn seven and eight. That's where he had that little spin problem. But uh, he's obviously pushing very, very hard, as he will have to, to try to catch Chris Cord to win this race. Cord has a very tidy lead.
lead over Gloy in the points, 135 to 105, and Gloy doesn't want him to get any further ahead, so he's just pushing as hard as he can. Tom Gloy from Southern California. He used to have his own team in sedan racing on the Trans Am circuit. Won that championship in 1984 and then moved over to the Roush Racing Ford Factory effort in GTO. Got his first victory at the 24 Hours of Daytona earlier this year. Picked up a solo win at West Palm Beach. And I believe Gary Lee has more on Mr. Gloy. Well, we're setting by the Tom Gloy pit. They are prepared to change all four tires if he so desires. But only Tom Gloy knows that he actually flat of the tires when he made that little loop. So we're waiting right now in the pit area. The crew is ready, but so far he has not stopped. If Tom Gloy flat spotted the tires uh, very, very badly, he'll get so much vibration that it'll be very hard to steer the car. But I'm going to guess that unless the car is virtually impossible to drive, he'll stay out there this late in the race. The race has about 30 minutes left to run, and uh, Gloy is going to have to keep pushing. Well, the battle continues. Driver points very much at stake here as we watch Chris Cord making his way around through turns 8 and 9. Excuse me, no, he's on the front side. Those are turns 4 and 5. It's tough to tell if you can't get a look at what's going on up in the background, but Chris Cord remains your leader. Tom Gloy trying to run him down in the Mustang. We'll be back to Portland after this. Turn of events as Tom Gloy in the second place car pulls off and a safety worker coming up to find out what the problem is. But Tom Gloy is in serious trouble. Yeah, that would be a, a very, that would be a fatal accident for Gloy because he would have pulled into the pits before if he had that happened in the five seconds as he was passing the pits. He would have come out of nine and gone into the pits if it were something that he thought he could have fixed. Let's go down to Marty Reed in the Ford pits and see what he can tell us. Well, guys, we're not in the Ford pits. We're just about uh, 50 feet away waiting for them to bring the car over and there's oil coming out from underneath the bottom of the car. We'll take a walk over here and see if we can get a word with Tom Gloy real quickly. Tom, what happened? Uh, the motor let go, unfortunately. I tell you, we were having a pretty good run in our Mustang. It was, uh, looked like it might have been a pretty good day. Had a little bit of a little trouble on that pit stop, but the uh, car was good. Uh, she just let go unexpectedly. A tough break for Tom Gloy, and the forces of Jack Roush continue to dwindle. Okay, let's take a look at replay of what happened to Tom Gloy. Coming out of turn no, nine, Gloy's motor just let go. There it is right there. You see a puff of smoke, and Tom heading for the pit wall now, trying to get the car off the track as fast as possible. He's hard on the brakes, and he'll turn in at the end of the pit wall, and his day is over, unfortunately. A very good run for Tom Gloy, but his racing day is over. There is our leader, making his way down the straightaway one more time. Number 98. Toyota Celica Turbo of Chris Cord. Chris Cord's doing a very, very tidy job of driving here. He uh, seems to have the ability to, to lead well and to come from behind. Here comes Willie T. Ribs up behind uh, Bruce Jenner. The superior power of the Toyota is uh, obvious here as Willie's uh, coming right down the inside of Bruce Jenner and takes him going on into turn one. So Willie's still racing real hard. And as Willie passes Bruce Jenner, that will put Willie up into third, into fourth position on the racetrack, dropping Jenner back down into fifth. Marty Reed is standing by in the Gurney pits. Yes, and Dan Gurney has been very excited about the move that Willie T. Ribs has made. Willie uh, is running with a serious vibration, isn't he, Dan? Well, ever since he came in, uh, when, when Scott ran into him, it blew a tire, a right rear tire. It also bent something, and we said, Willie, come in if you feel like it's going to be bad. He said, no, I'm going to stay out. But it does have a high-speed vibration, and right now he's trying to pass Jenner for third. And he's got him. Okay, now he's, he's running down uh, Bob Earl. What about Chris Cord? Now with over a lap lead, will you change strategy, having back off a little bit? I really haven't talked to them yet. I would think that would be the good thing to do, but uh, right now I'm looking at Willie trying to run down Earl and to decide whether or not he should come in or not. So, as you can see, the Toyota pit still wants to finish 1-2 if they can. Okay, I was about to make that scoring correction when Willie T. passed Bruce Jenner. He moved into third place on a racetrack, so your order is Chris Cord on a lap by himself. 
Bob Earl in second, Willie T. Ribs is third, Bruce Jenner is fourth, and coming up in fifth position, the number seven of Irv Hare. And Ribs is only five seconds behind Earl, so it would be a remarkable occurrence for Willie T. Ribs to get clobbered by Scott Pruitt in the turn and still come out and get second in the race. Here is your leader, Chris Cord, out of Beverly Hills, California, making his way onto the front straightaway once more, leading easily here in the Pure Leader 300 at Portland. There you see 37-year-old Bob Earl out of Larkspur, California, being attended to by his team. You see the blood on his face, and there is the reason. The windshield came out of the car and is now lying at trackside in the turn four area, and somehow, whatever caused that windshield to come off, or perhaps the windshield itself, hit Bob Earl full in the face, and it looks like he's okay, but... First the roof came off, and then the windshield came out, and it looks like uh, Bob got peppered in the face either with the glass from the windshield or perhaps from uh, rocks or uh, pieces of rubber from the track. And anyway, he looks okay, but uh, he has uh, taken some uh, hits in the face there from some track debris or debris from the windshield. And, and there he is out of the race. There, there you see the number 99 of Willie T. Ribbs shown in second place. We expected a battle and we have gotten one. And the attrition has been enormous. Four Ford Mustangs from the Jack Roush camp start of the race. There is but one left in the race. Bruce Jenner right there in third position. Two Chevys started for Tommy Riggins and for Greg Pickett. They are both out of the race. The Pontiac of Bob Earl is out of the race. The only two potential challengers for the manufacturer's championship from the Toyota camp are running 1-2 at this point. Let's go back now to the Bob Earl story. We are down here with Bob Earl after seeing a lot of lacerations around the face, some medical attention, but you tell me you're okay. I'm okay. It just scared me more than anything. Uh, like nicking yourself shaving then? No, it was the, the uh, sort of explosion when it, when it caved in. It, uh, the roof had come loose a long time ago. And when I went down to draft Irv, at the end of the straightaway, you get a lot of turbulence in the draft. And right when I pulled out of the draft and hit the brakes, the windshield caved in on me. And I just couldn't see where I was going. I was just happy I got it slowed down. We were talking earlier, watching the medical attention here. You were wearing a full or an open face helmet. Uh, is this some indication you may go to a full face helmet in the future? No, that wasn't the problem. I had. I had good goggles on and everything. That, that didn't really hurt me. It just feels like I shaved too rough, you know. But uh, it just scared me more than anything. And after, I can't drive the car without a windshield. After a great drive, he's out, but he's okay. And that's good news. Whenever you see an accident like that, it's good to see the driver get out and walk away from it. Well, in case you don't think it's violent out there, folks, what better proof could you ask for as you watch Chris Cord making his way around in the lead. He is on a lap by himself. We're working lap number 59, excuse me, 89, which leaves us with nine laps yet to run here in the Pure Later 300 at Portland International Raceway in the Rose City of the Pacific Northwest, Portland, Oregon. Things have worked out for the Toyota team just perfectly. Their uh, drivers, Chris Cord and Willie T. Ribs, are running 1-2. Uh, Cord has run very much in the front for uh, about half this race. Uh, Willie T. Ribs, uh, who is behind him at least a lap, is also running strongly at this time. So it looks like a 1-2 finish for Toyota is possible, and certainly they're going to come out of this war uh, well ahead of the Ford and Chevrolet factory efforts. So the Toyotas are up front with a Ford in third. In fourth place is the Oldsmobile, and back in sixth and seventh are a couple of GTU cars. GTU 300 kilometer race. We have six laps remaining. There you see the two Toyotas of Chris Cord, Willie T. Ribs up front. Bruce Jenner with one of his best finishes of the year in third place for the Roush Mustang team. Irv Hare in an Oldsmobile is fourth. And Roger Mandeville has his special three rotor Mazda in fifth position. In the GTU standings, a good battle all day long. Terry Fisger and a Pontiac up front. Tom Kendall, the points leader in the race for the series championship in second place in his Mazda, followed by the Mazda of Amos Johnson the Nissan of Max Jones, and the Mazda of Tom's brother, Bart Kendall. That's going to tighten up the GTU point standings just a little bit with uh, Visker uh, going for his third win uh, over Tom Kendall. Tom Kendall is uh, leading at this time in the GTU point standings, but Terry Visker is coming right up behind him. Four of the top five drivers in the battle for the GTU championship represented there in the top five. 
Here's our leader, Chris Cord, coming uh, down into the S turns before turn nine. And uh, he's looking very, very strong, very smooth. Uh, we caught him at a 109 lap time uh, just about a few laps ago, which is uh, still only two or three seconds off his uh, qualifying pace. So his car is obviously uh, still very, very strong as he goes past the uh, Mercure, who tries to get in behind him to draft, but that's not going to work for very long. Another point about the uh, the battle for Terry Visger. Should he win today, it'll be his fourth victory in a row. He skipped a race with his Fiero, but this will be the fourth victory as you watch Chris Cord's wife looking on from pit road. She really doesn't look too nervous. I think uh, she's been through this before, and her husband's doing a great job. He's very cool on the track, and uh, she's very cool in the pits. That's what a lap lead will do for you, I guess. But it's been a, a spotless race for Chris Cord in what has been, I'd have to say, a very messy day on the racetrack. We've seen some spins, a lot of body contact, but Chris Cord is basically unblemished in his Toyota Celica Turbo as he makes his way up behind Max Jones, who we saw running in the top five in GTU. A good run for Max today. So the detritus of today's race lying at trackside with four laps remaining. Chris Cord, grandson of American Airlines, the building of Cord Automobiles. Chris Cord has uh, come on very, very strongly as a race car driver in the last two years. He's come on from being a steady race driver to being a steady and fast race driver. Talking to Dan Gurney yesterday in the pits, and he said Cord is every bit as fast as uh, as any of his drivers and is steady, can make the car last. And here we see the results of a strong, steady, and fast driver, Chris Cord, with a good, strong lap lead on his teammate, Willie T. Ribs. Well, he certainly showed us back at Riverside earlier this year that he's a very cool customer when he started at the back of the pack, spun himself to the rear, made his way all the way to the front of the pack twice against some of the finest sedan drivers in the world. Chris Cord is a very deserving champion. This is quite a different race for Chris Cord. He's been out in the lead most of the way, and he set a very nice pace for himself in not using up his machinery. He's, he's fended off a, a couple of challenges, and Willie T. Ribbs, shown here in the 99 car, is in second place more than a lap behind Chris Cord. Willie has been in the pits twice. Uh, he was in an incident with Scott Pruitt in turn nine, uh, where Scott Pruitt actually came out the worst, and Willie was able to continue on, but it took any chance of Willie's winning the race uh, away from him. Willie T running fifth in driver points this year. Kind of the difference, I think, between an aggressive driver like Willie and a very conservative and steady driver like Chris Cord. Willie T's record shows finishes like 17th, 21st, 13th, along with the ones and the twos and the threes. Whereas Chris Cord, despite a 14th place finish after an accident at Road Atlanta that was not his fault, Chris Cord has not finished worse than fourth all year long. I was most impressed by Cord at Riverside when he spun on the opening lap. As we look at Dan Gurney, the team manager for both Cord and Ribs, uh, I was most impressed by Cord coming from all the way at the back after a first lap spin to pass every car in the field and win the race at Riverside in a 500-kilometer contest. Well, with two laps remaining, the next time around for Chris Cord will be one lap to go. There is Bruce Jenner pulling in now. Jenner running in third place right now. This has this cannot be a scheduled stop. No, let's go down to Marty Reed. Something wrong here. Well, Chris, we can tell you that Bruce Jenner is running the sixth leader. They just needed to get a splash of fuel. Otherwise, they were going to run dry. Well, that's called a splash and go pit stop in race car parlance. And uh, I don't think it's going to cost Bruce Jenner a position. He's running, he was running in a pretty strong third place, so he probably lost 15 or 20 seconds going in and making that very, very short few-second pit stop to take uh, a few liters of fuel just so he could finish. Here's the final lap with Chris Cord shown coming in to turn one for the last time. White flag lap for Chris Cord. Bruce Jenner stopped, incidentally, on lap 43 for a full tank of gas and wasn't able to go that last, what, 54 laps without stopping for a splash of fuel. But Bruce Jenner remains in third place. Willie T. Ribs remains in second place. And here is your leader, Chris Cord, on his way to his third victory in the Camel GTO season for 1987. These Toyotas, even though they look uh, like relatively normal sedans, are very sophisticated race cars. The carbon fiber and Kevlar bodies of these cars are put together with great care by the All-American racers uh, of Dan Gurney. And these cars are really thoroughbred race cars, uh, sort of disguised uh, as family cars. One more point about
about the driver's point with this victory. Chris Corn really puts the series championship in his pocket. For five races remaining, one coming up this weekend at Sears Point, California, he will have a huge lead. The second, third, and fourth place drivers in class are all out of the race at this point. Willie T. Ribs in fifth place, his teammate, is the only man who can challenge Chris Cord. Congratulations to Chris Cord. His crew is shown very jubilant. Dan Gurney jumping up and down. And here's his uh, victory lap. Here's the GTU winner, Terry Visker, number 55. A very strong performance for Terry. Fourth victory in a row for Terry Visker in his 55 car out of Santa Clara, California, the Huffaker Racing Pontiac Fiero. And right in front of him, Tommy Kendall, the man that he is chasing for the championship in GTU. So a great victory for our two winners, Chris Cord and Terry Visker. We'll be back to show you final results and talk with our winners from Portland, Oregon, after these messages. Back at Portland, Gary Lee is standing by with our winner, Chris Cord. Chris, congratulations. You're the silent type. You let your foot do the talking, uh, all the... Uh hoopla this weekend between Scott Pruitt and your teammate Willie T, but uh, when the final shootout was over, you're in victory lane. Well, you know, we, uh, we've we got that kind of a combination on this team. Uh, Willie's uh, really quick, and uh, you know, and, and he uh, kind of opens the door for me, and I just think that uh, my patience, uh, you know, obviously paid off for us today, but uh, really the, the credit goes to the crew for the uh, fantastic preparation of this car. I mean, we've We've been, we have not had a mechanical failure on this race car all season long, and that, and I just can't even tell you, I don't have words to describe how good a feeling that is. So it's really, uh, it's really the crew and how they're putting this car together, and Toyota's, a tribute to Toyota and a tribute to Dan Gurney for the hard work they've done. So if they give us good equipment, we can, uh, we can win all the time like this. So it's, it's great. Three wins this season all on ESPN. Congratulations. Go up there and spray some thank, champagne. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, apparently we are. Lucky talisman for Chris Cord, our winner. There you see the top five, Willie T. Ribs in a Toyota, followed by Bruce Jenner's Mustang, Irv Herod in Oldsmobile, and Roger Mandeville in a Mazda. There are your GTU standings. Terry Visger over defending series champ Tom Kendall, North Carolina's Amos Johnson, Max Jones, and Bart Kendall. We hope you've enjoyed our coverage of the Purolator 300K from Portland, Oregon. Tom Blackhaller, your closing thoughts on today's race. Toyota's making it very tough on Ford and Chevrolet. It's going to be a great race to the finish, but Toyota's in a commanding spot now in the GTO division. Well, next up, the GTO race at Sears Point, California. We hope you'll be with us for that. From Portland, Oregon, I'm Bob Barsha for Gary Lee, Marty Reed, and Tom Blackhaller. We'll see you next time. So long from the Pacific Northwest.